The Tom Woods Show, episode 1596. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, there are a lot of people out there who will support you and will buy from you if you accept Bitcoin. But if you've ever wanted to accept payment in Bitcoin and were afraid that it would just be too complicated to figure out and set up, well, I have the solution. A free video series I've assembled that walks you through the process step by step and makes it really easy. Check it out at tomwoods.com slash Bitcoin. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here wrapping up Walter Block Week today. And I'm going to, as I said yesterday, go through Walter's list of publications, look at the various topics and headings, and just pick some out and discuss them with him. Remember, you can go to walterblock.com and see Walter's publications. There are very, has a very great number of them, and at least a decent percentage of them are available online. A lot of times with scholarly articles, especially going back many years, it's tricky to find them online, particularly for free, but a bunch of them are indeed online. So walterblock.com, by this point, you know who Walter Block is. He is almost certainly the most prolific living libertarian. He's a professor of economics at Loyola University, New Orleans. Over 600 scholarly articles to his credit, as well as over 30 books. And today we wrap up our week together. Walter, welcome back. Tom, it's always a delight to be with you. Thanks for having me again. Well, this is it, Walter. Friday, that's it. That's the end of Walter Block Week. So I'm going to throw as many topics I can get uh, in here at you. First one would probably be the longest one, though. And that's on libertarian punishment theory. Now, you've described this, and again, I think you're following in the footsteps of Rothbard on this, of uh, describing your punishment theory as two teeth for a tooth. So I steal your TV, then you're entitled not only to get your TV back, but in effect to get my TV also. So two teeth for a tooth. So the question is, obviously, to some degree, punishment is sort of arbitrary. There's nothing etched in the nature of the universe that makes it one thing or the other. So is there a way we can justify and defend that particular one as the libertarian kind of punishment theory? Uh, Tom, in a in, uh, previous day, I forget which day it was, you uh, asked me what are the things I'm most proud about, and I mentioned abortion and sociobiology and privatization and blackmail and economic freedom. I forgot punishment theory. Punishment theory is another thing that I've uh, contributed and I'm very proud of and I'm very happy with what I've done. Okay, so uh, two teeth for a tooth. Well, yes, if, if uh, I steal your TV, the first thing that has to happen when I'm caught by the hopefully private police, but even the public police, is I've got to give you your TV back. Now, from a, a pragmatic utilitarian point of view, if all I have to do is give you the TV back, then the, the present discounted value or the, or the expected value, sorry, uh, of my theft is half the TV, uh, assuming I get caught half the time. Because if I get caught... Uh, all I have to do is give you your TV back. And if I don't get caught, I get your TV. So if half the time I steal your TV, the expected value of me stealing your TV is half a TV, assuming that I'm only caught half the time. So this will not be a much of a uh, an incentive for me not to uh, be committing uh, crimes. But that's just pragmatism. Uh, I think a part of libertarianism, which I uh, get in the interstices of libertarianism, uh, the penumbras, as they do from the Constitution, is uh, what I did to you has to be done to me. Well, what I did to you is I took your TV, so therefore you should take my TV. So we now have 2.0, not 1.9, not 2.1 TVs, but 2.0 TVs. One, I have to give you back uh, your TV, and two, I have to give you one of mine, assuming that it's of equal value. But I don't think that's enough. I, I think we have to go further. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, giving you back the TV, uh, let's suppose it took five years uh, for you, uh, you and your friends, the private police, to find me. Well, who's going to pay for that? It took you five years to find me, and you know you were looking, maybe not full time, but finally you caught me. Well, who's going to pay for all that time and effort? Me. So I have to pay for the cost. Now, suppose that immediately right after I steal your TV, I go right to the private police and I say, hey, you know, I stole Tom's TV. I'm sorry. Here it is. Well, then there's no cost of capture. But when I stole your TV, I did something else. What I did was I uh, scared you. Now, even if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're not scared of anything, still, you know, your, your uh, sense of security is uh, weakened. Well, I think that uh, I have to be scared, too. Uh, the punishment has to fit the crime. And um, how are you going to scare me? Go up 
to me behind me and go boo or maybe uh, break a balloon and make it pop. No. What you have to do is make me play Russian roulette with the number of bullets and the number of chambers proportional to how badly I uh, did it. If I came to your house uh, empty-handed, well, then uh, fewer bullets and more chambers. Uh, on the other hand, if I came with a gun, well, then uh, more chambers. And if I, and if you were not at home, well, then fewer chambers. But if you were at home and I waved the gun at you, then more bullets and fewer chambers. Uh, I'm not giving you any numbers here. Now, it's true there was only a stinking lousy TV, and we don't want me to be killed uh, over it. But, you know, maybe uh, instead of Russian roulette where I have to put the gun at my forehead, maybe I'll put it at my pinky. And if I lose, I have to shoot my pinky off or something like that. Um, uh, I uh, credit former students of mine who changed my views on this. I've got some brilliant students uh, that I'm very grateful to. So in my view, the the true punishment theory, and, and I think Murray agreed with me on this. I, I I think maybe I forget whether I, I started this or he started this, but he and I agree on this. Um, it's two teeth for a tooth plus cost of expenditures plus um, uh, compensation for scaring. That would be my view of what the proper libertarian punishment theory is. And I think that this meets two criteria. One, uh, pragmatism or utilitarianism. Namely, this is going to, you know, we're going to be pretty draconian, we libertarians. We don't really much like thieves. And we're going to make them pay not only for the cost of capture, uh, but also uh, for the scaring. And and that can be very serious. So uh, that's just the pragmatic or the utilitarian. But I think from a deontological point of view, it's justified to do these things to me. Who the hell am I to steal your TV? I'm pretty – now, if I'm a kid, I'm, from, I'm six years old, you know, uh, things are a little different for children. Uh, children we have to be easier with because they're not really functioning adults. Uh, or maybe even a senile person uh, – what the heck? There are gray areas all over the place. But I'm an adult. I'm in my own right mind. And I steal your TV? Oh, no. We're not letting me get away with uh, uh, two TVs. It's two TVs plus cost of capture plus uh, punishment for scaring. How does this translate into um, a libertarian discussion of the death penalty? Well, um, I mean, what's your view of the death penalty? And do you think it's justified under libertarianism? Let me uh, give no, no, you not the question of can the state have the power to kill somebody, but in principle, at least, regardless of who it is doing it, in principle, could death be a legitimate punishment? Well, let me give you an example that'll make the voluntary slavery look like uh, uh, you know easy. Uh, I defend the libertarian concentration camp guard. Let me say that again: libertarian concentration camp guard. Okay, so here's the situation. Uh, the Nazis have a concentration camp guard and they're killing Jews and blacks and gypsies and uh, gays and whoever else they're killing. And each guard has to kill 100 people a day. But I come in there and I only can kill 90 people and I won't be caught by the Nazis. Whereas if I kill 89 or fewer, they'll uh, unearth me and they'll say, you're no real uh, concentration camp guard, we're going to execute you. So I kill 90 people a day. Why do I do it? Because I'm a libertarian. I want to save lives. And I know that 100 people a day are going to die. And I'm going to save 10 people a day. At the end of the week, I've uh, saved 70 people and I've killed 630 people. Well, what should happen to me? What should happen to me is I'm now caught by the, uh, uh, the Nuremberg trial and I make my plea. I say, look, I'm a murderer. If any of the heirs of the 630 people want to kill me, they're justified because the death penalty is justified because, you know, I stole a life and therefore, well, I should really get two lives. But, you know, if we're people like cats and had nine lives, I'd owe two plus cost of capture and, and um, scaring. But uh, we only have one life. I owe a life. However, I plead with you, please let me go because I wish I could have saved your uncle, your aunt, your, your son, your parent, uh, your child. But I, I, I just save people at random. I didn't know who I was saving. I just saved 10 people a day, and I had to kill 90 people a day. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten away with it. But if, if you want – the death penalty is justified, and you're perfectly entitled to put me to death, but you really should have a little uh, ticker tape parade for me first and uh, give me a little medal because I saved 70 people. And the reason I did it – and motivation is, is pretty important because – you know, uh, so – I favor the death penalty, and I'm trying to give you this case to show that I, I don't uh, shrink from tough examples, uh, like from um, uh, uh, from what do you call it, voluntary slavery or anarchism. Well, you know, libertarian concentration camp guard is pretty far out there. Good grief, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> 
What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> I love it, Tom. It's about time somebody said this. All right, look. <laughs> All right. Let's try to get on something uh, less controversial. How about... What do you mean about controversial? Or- this is very straightforward. Yeah. How about <laughs> organs, right? Is organs. There, yeah, yes. We hear some libertarians talk about there should be a market in organs and the reason that people who need organ transplants are on waiting lists forever and then they die is that we've artificially priced organs at zero. And so if we didn't do that, people would be much more willing to donate organs. But then I've heard as an objection to that, that you would get criminal organ harvesters who would see the profits to be made from human organs and they would step up their kidnapping efforts just to get the organs. And so people would be endangered by this. What do you think? Oh, I favor um, markets and organs um, just because there could be criminals. Look, uh, maybe we shouldn't have gold mining because criminals will steal gold. Maybe we shouldn't uh, grow food because uh, criminals will steal the food. I, I don't think much of that argument. And and what's this we white man stuff? You know, we uh, uh, did this. Lou Rockwell is always um, um, – telling me, don't say we when we refer to the state, they. I never do it. I make the same mistake. You know, there are 80,000 people on the waiting list for a a kidney. And they're on a dialysis machine. And a dialysis machine, I think you have to go like every other day or maybe every day, depending upon how, uh, how badly your kidneys are. And you have to sit connected to a machine, which is very inconvenient and hurts. Uh, for six, eight hours a day to, to do the job of the kidney. And yet there are kidneys that go into the grave. And, and this uh, offends me both as an economist and as a, um, uh, and as a uh, libertarian theorist, because from the libertarian point of view, the only thing that we prescribe, the only thing that we uh, prohibit is uh, the initiation of violence. Yes, we, uh, we're against uh, people grabbing kidneys. Uh, but, you know, if I donate a kidney to you, Tom, that's okay. But if I charge you for it, it's not okay. Well, that means it's an attack on commerce. Look, if I go to bed with a girl, I might be accused of fornication or adultery or whatever, but uh, it's usually not against the law. But if somehow I pay for it, then that's bad. Well, this is crazy. This is offensive to the economist in me and to the libertarian in me. Just because you pay for something that is otherwise okay, uh, you're a criminal? No. So if you can donate a kidney, you, sh- you should be able to charge for it. If you can uh, go to bed with, with a woman, uh, she ought to be able to charge you uh, if she wants. Uh, namely, prostitution and payment for kidneys uh, would be legal. See, the problem is here you have people dying because they don't have a kidney. And then you have other people with kidneys who go into the grave with um, perfectly good kidneys. But uh, you, know, uh, you know what they call motorcycles? They call them donor mobiles. Because people my age usually don't um, – I'm 78. We don't drive motorcycles that much. And and the good thing about motorcycle deaths is that uh, you die like that quickly and all your uh, innards are uh, working fine. You're 25 years old. Whereas if I gave a kidney to somebody, the kidney might not be worth all that much because it's an old kidney. So you have people needlessly going to death because they don't have a kidney, and then you have other people who uh, uh, go into the cemetery with perfectly good kidneys, and, and you have to ask their parents right at the time when they're grieving, can you please give me your son's kidney, and you don't get that many kidneys. So that, you know, we were talking about murder before. Well, the people responsible for this are murderers. These people are murderers. They're putting people in, in cemeteries, the kidney dialysis people, and uh, say nothing about heart and spleen and liver and other. Uh, there was this uh, case in Canada where um, a four-year-old boy needed a liver, and the father put in a, um, an ad in the paper saying, I'll pay a million dollars for a liver. And they put him in jail. They put the father in jail. I mean, this is really despicable. So I'm a big uh, supporter of uh, free enterprise and free enterprise, not just for post offices and, and for paper clips and and, uh, cough drops, but for innards, uh, kidneys, hearts, livers, uh, whatever it is. All right. I got a a few more. And so we got to just jump from one topic to the other completely at random, it seems. But they're just things – I was looking through your articles and I just picked out a few things that you and I have never talked about before. You have an article on conjoined twins. Do you remember this? I I, I forgot what I wrote. (laughs) I don't mind. We can – but let's say, okay, does the no, Walter? I'll, how does I'll the Walter to... Block brain work on the spot? If I say you got conjoined twins, what's the libertarian approach to this? Oh, Tom, you're nasty. All right, well, I don't mind skipping no, no. it. That's that's dirty pool on my no, part. Let me, let me try to reconstruct this. The the question is, who owns what? 
And uh, my answer, and I forget what I wrote about it, but my answer right now, right off the top of my head, is uh, going back to John Locke and uh, Murray Rothbard and Hans Hoppe, who are uh, my three uh, favorite people on homesteading. Whoever homesteaded it first is the owner of it. So the older twin, if there's a look, if there's no conflict, well, then the conjoined twins, uh, you know, just do their thing. But if there's a conjoined twin and one wants to um, uh, go to the left and one wants to go to the right, the older one should um, have the uh, the power to decide that because the older one homesteaded the uh, the, the um, material that's owned by both, or the, say the head, whatever, the, the leg. I, I don't know uh, where the conjoined twins are conjoined, but if they're conjoined, then a part of them is owned by both. And now we have a conflict. One wants to, um, you know, uh, eat pizza and one wants to have a burger. Well, how do they decide? Well, they should, namely, I'm trying to apply libertarian theory to uh, esoteric uh, cases and conjoined twins are pretty esoteric uh, from a a libertarian point of view. So that would be my answer right off the bat. And now what I'm going to do after I get off is I'm going to go read what I wrote and see if I wrote that. And if not, I'm in trouble. One of my favorite Walter Block publication stories is the one about the book review where you reviewed a book and then you write so much that you reviewed the book again because you'd forgotten that you'd already reviewed it. (laughs) So you had two. I'm I'm getting senile, Tom. I couldn't help myself. I I wrote the the same book review twice. It's really pathetic. And now I'm working on defending the undefendable three. And I find that I've written him twice. I'm pathetic. They ought to cart me off to the loony bin or something. Uh, But I have one saving grace. A lot of times I can't think of a word. And, and I think I'm getting seen all. But then I remember when I was in college, I had two roommates. And we always had this rule that, you know, after dinner, everybody studies for two or three hours. Except for one thing, if you couldn't think of a word, then you were allowed to disturb your uh, roommate. And we were always disturbing each other. So even when I was 23 or so, I, I still couldn't think of words sometimes. So I, I think I'm still okay, but just barely. I'm struggling. Uh, well, look, I mean, you're, to to my mind, you're, you're un- unbelievable still cranking stuff out at the pace you're doing it. All right, I have a couple more. Uh, One of them is also drawn from an article that you might not remember. It's from 2011, but it just interested me because I had never heard of this. And it was called Toward a Libertarian Theory of Charitable Donations. But I don't even know what's involved there that there would need to be a libertarian theory of that. Do you remember what you were thinking about there? Uh, Mark Hughes, uh, a buddy of mine, he and I have co-authored some stuff on charity. And I do have a chapter in uh, one of the undefendable, I forget which one, uh, the non-contributed to charity. Yes, that's right. Uh, namely, you know, everyone's saying charity is good, charity is good. So, you know, y- you know, uh, getting back to my two college roommates, when, when I was in college and I had these two roommates, uh, they had these dolls w- with, where they had a, a, a wire for the neck and you sort of hit the head of the doll and the doll goes, yes. Well, they get it. They got a doll. You hit the head. It goes no, and they gave it to me. So I, I ha- I'm sort of a you know, off the road kind of a person. Uh, when everyone says this, I'm trying to think of alternatives. Well, everyone favors charity, and I favor charity. Charity is a, a virtuous uh, thing to help the poor. So my natural thing is, well, you know, can we attack this? Well, suppose somebody refuses to give charity. Is he a violator of rights? No. Uh, and then I would go into all the negatives of charity. If you give people charity, they become dependent. Uh, they, uh, they don't work as hard as they otherwise would. Uh, so charity is a mixed bag. Yes, it's virtuous uh, to help the poor, but sometimes the best way to help the poor is with tough love and not to give them money or not to give too much money. Bill Gates has got a problem. He's got uh, $22 zillion dollars. And he's got kids. Well, how much should he give to them? If he gives them, um, you know, uh, uh, ten billion each, will that hurt them? Will will that um, uh, detract them from working hard, or will will they just sit back and and drink um, uh, iced tea for the rest of their lives and not do anything and have miserable lives? So th- there are negatives on charity as well as positives. Okay, so then one that you know quite you recall quite vividly, of course, because of where you are, namely New Orleans, is Hurricane Katrina. And you've done some work on how libertarians should think about that disaster. So how should we, is there a way of looking at that, that uh, in which a society not dominated by the state would have coped better? Yes. Well, uh, there were two or three things about that. One is I wrote a, a, um, 
uh, co-authored an article with my friend Lou Rockwell, who I'm a big admirer of too. He's the head of the, not the head of the Mises Institute. He's the uh, founder of the Mises Institute. Uh, he was the head of it, and, and now Jeff Dice is uh, is the president of it. Uh, Lou Rockwell and I co-authored an article on that, and I I did a few more articles on that. So I have a few things to say about Katrina. First of all, Katrina never hit New Orleans. It missed us by 40 miles. It it went east of us in, in the Mississippi. On the other hand, you know, it knocked down a few buildings. Uh, you know, the, the the problem with an earthquake is how much notice do you get from an earthquake? One minute? Ten seconds? You know how much notice people had for Katrina? They had, um, I don't know, a week or two? It was on TV. Well, well Katrina's out here, and we expect it's going to land, fall, and, you know, next Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the morning or something like that. People had plenty of time to get out, but they didn't get out. A lot of people didn't get out. Uh, and people say well, Katrina killed 1,900 people. No, Katrina didn't kill 1,900 people. What killed 1,900 people was the Army Corps of Engineers, because what happened was the levees uh, that was uh, try to keep the you know New Orleans is in a bowl under the sea level, and uh, they have these um, levees uh, that are supposed to keep the Mississippi River uh, away from us, and the levees failed. Now, the economist in me is very unhappy uh, because uh, not so much that 1,900 people died. You know, we're callous, we economists. Uh, the libertarian part of me or you know, the human part of me is very unhappy. 1,900 people died. A lot of them died because the water kept going up and up, and they couldn't get through their um, uh, through their attics. They, they didn't have uh, an axe or something, and they just drowned. Uh, but the reason – that the people died was one, they didn't get out, and, and two, it was the Army Corps of Engineers. So the economist is me is very unhappy that they're still in business. Can you imagine if McDonald's killed 1,900 people, God forbid, or uh, Walmart killed 1,900 people? They wouldn't be in jail anymore. But the Army Corps of Engineers is still in, in, in uh, business, and this is uh, straight out of Henry Hazlitt. And by the way, we mentioned in my books, um, Economics uh, – Defending the Undefendable. Those are my homage to Henry Hazlitt's Economics and Warren Lesson. Now, I don't put my books in the same category as his, but uh, he has a, a principle and 35 uh, instances of it, and that's what I have in my books, Defending the Undefendable. So what Henry Hazlitt would say is, well, uh, you know, if, if the river were privatized, and now I have a book on um, privatizing rivers, oceans, and lakes, and stuff like that. If the river were privatized, probably the levees would have held. And if they didn't hold, then the Mississippi River uh, would have gone into other hands. They would have gone bankrupt. They would have been sued. And, and we would have had a different uh, people in charge of the Mississippi River. So uh, those are two points about it. And the third point is price gouging. When the Mississippi River uh, uh, overflowed and, and people were living here, the prices skyrocketed. And the uh, governor, Blanco, the governor of uh, Louisiana at the time, said, anyone price gouging, I'm putting in jail. Well, you know, we have um, two motivations for people in Montana to come out here and help us. One is benevolence, which would be operational no matter what. But the other is greed or uh, seeking profits. Well, at the old old uh, prices of orange juice for a buck a, a, a quart or whatever it was, uh, they're not coming. But if orange juice all of a sudden is 20 bucks a quart, well, then they're going to come down here with a truckload of orange juice and help us. So that's one benefit of price gouging. When the prices rise, it's a signal for help. It's sort of like if you're in the wilderness and, and you have decibel control and all you can go is help, help. You can't yell help. Uh, that's, that's the effect of that. And the other is uh, the egalitarians ought to like this because look, at the old prices, the first 300 people in the Walmart are going to grab up everything. But if instead of a dollar a quart for orange juice, it's $20 a quart for orange juice, people at the front of the line are going to act as if they have some benevolence for people at the back of the line, and they leave something left over for them. So price gouging is good. And when I get freshman students in my class, and I mention price gouging or the minimum wage, they are biologically hardwired to hate it because they're, they're full of benevolence, but their their adherence to free enterprise is not as, um, as, uh, as, as strongly uh, – uh, hardwired in, in their bodies. So uh, the other point that I would make about Katrina is price gouging is a, a beneficial thing and it's compatible with libertarianism. And I'll probably stick it in defending three if I haven't already done it. I'll have to look, make sure I don't write about it again. Well, how about this for, um, as we're starting to wrap up Walter Block Week, would you be willing to take one of the topics you're covering in defending three and give us a sneak preview of yet another unpopular type of person you're defending this time around? Wow. Let me see. I'd have to uh, go. And, ah, here it is. I just have it on my screen. No, that's not it. No, it is. That's it. Let me see if I can come up with a list of um, defending three. 
Bum in the Library, uh, Cannibal. Wait, 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 no, 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 wait. <laughs> voluntary cannibal. Voluntary no, stop cannibal. it. <laughs> no, I can't take it anymore. I can't. T- it's been a whole week of Walter Block. This is more than I can take. I can't. I can't take it. <laughs> I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> I'm begging you for uh, mercy, Walter. Here we go. Adulterer, alcoholic, anarchist. No, no, no. Look, no. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> this is like. Clement and I are collectivist, company, town, corporation, buybacker, Burke O'Weara, boycotter, bottle deposit opponent, um, uh, confederate sympathizer, corporation, entrepreneur. Euthanasist, evictionist, executioner, oh ex post facto judge, I favor ex post facto law, hair braider, uh, indulgence seller, uh, um, mutilator, polygamist. All right, all right that's it. That's okay. it. We're gonna, we're gonna, the, people can be surprised by the rest. They can be surprised <laughs> when the time comes. All right. Look, look, if there's one thing you can say about Walter, well, actually, there's probably a whole bunch, but one of them would be fearless. And I think he has proven that to us over the course of Walter Block Week. So when do you think you might, you know, have this book ready, the third one? Well, maybe in uh, next year, 2021. Okay. Well, I'll clear the schedule to make sure we have you on to talk about that. And I'm just going to have to, I don't know. I'm, I know you don't drink, Walter, but thanks to your book, I sure do. So I will be ready <laughs> for that conversation. <laughs> Tom, I'm just delighted to be with you for a whole week. It was re- really a great experience. You were very generous uh, with your time, and I know the listening audience has has really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Tom, take care. Thanks. We'll be buddies, and we'll see each other soon. All right, folks, that's Walter Block Week. I've got another idea for a week coming up two weeks from now. So next week will just be regular individual episodes, but I've got a pretty good one that I think you'll enjoy sinking your teeth into. Before we depart for today, I want to tell you about uh, my friend Scott Medlin, who actually is a listener of The Tom Woods Show, and he has a website, medlinpro.com, M-E-D-L-I-N pro.com, and he is one of these online uh, earning folks uh, who is knowledgeable about affiliate marketing, and he can give you information about how to be effective at it, how to use the various free tools at your at your disposal to do it. And you can find out all about that at his website, medlinpro.com. I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1596, which is our show notes page for today. Your homework assignment over the weekend is, if you've been thinking about starting a website or a blog, check out the goodies you get if you get your hosting through me. Because you get, well, you get your hosting through Bluehost through me. And you get really nice goodies, including free publicity from me and membership in my super secret but awesome Mutual Help Bloggers Group. So uh, go check that out at tomwoods.com slash publicity, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.